hey everybody we are live so where is my first person that's going to tell me if the sound's working hey let me know if you can hear me this is paul moore and we're going to talk today about how to make ten thousand dollars a month without quitting your day job by passive semi-passive real estate investing so where are you from first of all can you hear me can you hear me okay zach let me know uh hunter says sounds good okay thank you very much hey i'm paul moore and i am an entrepreneur a serial entrepreneur been doing real estate for years and uh, want to, I've done all kinds of different things in real estate. I've flipped houses, I've flipped waterfront lots. Uh, I built a corporate housing, kind of quasi multifamily, quasi hotel in North Dakota, which we're gonna talk about this morning. And I often get asked, what is the fastest way to get in real estate? You know that question that's floating around the internet now. Um, you know, if you could uh, start over, what would you do if you could start over with $10,000? And I'm going to tell you today how to start over with less than $10,000 or how to get started in building a real estate career and bridging the gap from where you are now to where you want to go without a whole lot of risk, without a lot of hassle, without quitting your day job. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, thank you. Wow, we got a lot of people on here. So I want to say hi to a few people first while a few people are joining. Uh, hey, Michael. Uh, is it too late to become a real estate agent at 23? I became a real estate agent at about 40, so probably not. Craig List says, where can I find private lenders? We'll get back to you on that. Uh, actually, check uh, Bigger Pockets has all types of private lenders. It's a great resource for that. Hey, Audrey K., where are you from, by the way? I'd love to hear where you're from. Hey, Derek from Atlanta, options for first-timers with good credit. Yes, we have options for people with terrible credit to actually do this. And that's something I forgot to mention when I wrote an article on this recently in Bigger Pockets. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is tell me where you're from, give us a thumbs up, give us a share, give us hearts and likes and all that stuff because that will help Bigger Pockets get their word out to more real estate investors and help each one of us have a better community. So Andy from Iowa, hello, Christina from Orlando, Cody from Houston, Steve from Telluride. I heard that's a beautiful place. Steve, you were on here before. Hey, Scott Hughes. All right. Um, hey, one thing I want to mention is that if you're, if I don't get to your question on Facebook specifically, please copy and paste it in again when I go through the Q&A because I might miss it if it's on Facebook. I've got a little better runway here on YouTube for those of you who are on YouTube live to see all your questions and to be able to pull them all up at once. So we're working on that. Uh, hey, Richard Wallace from Dallas, Fisher G, Daniel Munoz. Um, hey, Kwame, Kwame Barton, thanks for coming. Joey, do you use self-directed IRA to buy property? Yes, I actually, uh, went to a seminar this weekend on converting from a self-directed IRA to a self-directed 401k. Might be something you might want to look into. Hey, Dean Moore from Southern California. It's early out there. Hey, Kyle from Portland. Israel de Santiago from Phoenix. Welcome. We're going to get started in just a minute, but uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story as I kind of lead into this. Uh, the year was 2010. I had a petroleum engineering degree and I had taken a year or two off of real estate because my income and my investments were all in real estate. And as you know, from 2006 or seven in our area through about 2010, things were rough. And so I decided to invest in oil and gas wells in North Dakota. And my business partner and I went there and every time we went, he had a small jet. Uh, we had to fly back out to somewhere else to stay because there were trucks and cars lining the sides of the road and at rest stops and in fields parking because there were all these oil workers in the Bakken oil rush who didn't have a place to stay. So we decided, why don't we set up a multifamily facility um, that can house these oil workers and we won't do it, we, we won't put these 
uh, metal trailers out there, RVs, like a lot of people did, which we thought was a fine thing to do. We, we're going to build something really beautiful that if the oil prices go down someday, this will be the last one standing. And that's exactly what we did. And there were hotels charging in Dickinson, North Dakota, up to $300 or even $400 a night for a regular Holiday Inn. And so we thought, well, let's be fair. So we charged $129 a night, and we had people coming in on long-term leases. People would lease for 6 and 12 months, and $129 a night turned out to be $3,900, almost $4,000 a month. These were for 300 square foot, beautifully furnished little studio apartments. And that was where I first got the idea to do long-term corporate rentals. We made a killing doing that. I won't tell you that we, uh, I, I won't get into the story about how what we did with the profits, uh, we invested in a Hyatt hotel that did not do so well. But that's another story for another day. And I do have a podcast. If you want to hear more about that, it's called How to Lose Money. Get it? Okay, good. So um, we, uh, the year was around 2000 and uh, let's see now, 13. And I started thinking 2014, how to get in to long-term real estate how to get into uh, back into real estate. And I, I wanted to get into the rental business. I wanted to get into apartments. And so I had this idea, what if, you know, long-term rentals, like things like we had done, they, they garner a huge um, price increase over just an unfurnished apartment. And I had the idea, but I didn't act on it till more recently. And the idea is, furnishing your apartment and setting it up for Airbnb. Now, of course, I didn't know about Airbnb back when we did this in North Dakota. It was out there, but I wasn't aware of it. But the question is, is there a way to do it that doesn't take a full-time effort? Anybody who's done Airbnb realizes that it takes a lot of effort. And um, it takes, you know, you have to go in and clean it between stays. You have to manage the guests. You have to tell them, you know, as I mentioned in my article, wh where the local grocery store is. You have to get involved. And there's up to, you know, potentially daily involvement. And I wondered if there was any way to do it without that kind of daily involvement. And I was at a conference recently. I met a guy named Martin. And Martin was drinking beer at 10 a.m., at this conference where everybody else was pretty well dressed. Martin was in flip flops and a Hawaiian shirt. And let's say he looked, um, well, a little more relaxed than everybody, everybody else. So I couldn't help but ask, I said, Hey, what are you, what are you doing for a living? He said, oh, I travel the world. <laughs> and I said, well, okay, you travel the world for a living. What, what did you do before that? What, how did you get there? Cause he's not very old. He said, Oh, I was a banker and I hated it. And then I discovered this, uh, way of making a lot of money through long-term corporate uh, tenants through Airbnb arbitrage. And I said, wait a minute, long-term corporate, can you explain? And he said, well, why don't you just go to this seminar with me? He said, the guy that taught it me, to me is named Al and Al's doing this seminar. So I went to the seminar and I tell you, the room was buzzing. There were people everywhere in the room who were so excited and I heard a lady next to me lean over and say, this is a game changer. This could change everything. So I'm going to tell you briefly how this works today. Al, Al had a bunch of apartments on his own. And Al was looking for a way to increase the profitability. I believe it was in Sacramento a number of years ago. And he decided to furnish one of them beautifully and go look for long-term corporate tenants. And when he, was, when he furnished it, he didn't have a corporate tenant immediately from the way I remember his story. And so he put it on Airbnb and he started filling in, you know, days and multiple days, maybe a few weeks at a time with Airbnb rentals. And then he found a corporate tenant and he put them in there. He took a big sigh of relief and he realized, hey, I'm making almost as much, not quite as much, from this corporate tenant and I'm not doing much of anything. I just got it set up and they're, they signed a six month lease and they're paying like two to three times what it costs me, what I usually get in rent for this apartment. And he thought, wait a minute, I can with very, very little effort, 
I can do corporate tenants rather than Airbnb. And so again, I'm not sure exactly the order of his thought process, but the point for you is what you, uh, the point for you is what Al learned next. So Al learned that if he set up apartments that, you know, he furnished them and set them up for Airbnb, then he could, um, he could learn, he could actually, um, set these up for corporate tenants, but plug Airbnb in the gaps. Hey, Dave Van Horn, good to have you on here. Dave Van Horn, by the way, was the head of the summit in Philadelphia. And Dave on Facebook Live is going to tell us when the next summit is because everybody should go to Dave's summit next April, I think it is, where Al was speaking. So I will uh, tell you more about that when Dave tells me here on Facebook. But at any rate, so the strategy is, Go out and if you have apartments that are empty, furnish them beautifully. You know, go for the Chip and Joanna Gaines look. Do beautiful professional photography and then put it on Airbnb. As soon as you have it starting to be leased up on Airbnb over with a short leash on the Airbnb and make the rooms cancelable, go out and look for corporate tenants. Now, there are nurses there are engineers, there are physical therapists, there are educators, there are even students uh, looking for long-term furnished corporate housing. And they're willing to pay a lot more than regular rent. For example, in my area, uh, you can rent an apartment for six to $800. But if you want a furnished corporate apartment for three to six to nine months, you might pay up to $2,000 a month for that same unit. And people will pay this rather than live in a hotel if they're traveling on business. Did you know, by the way, that 36% of the people, 36% of uh, the nights spent in hotels are, stay, are spent by people who are on long-term corporate assignments? That's a big number. And so there is a big market for this. I mean, look at the growth over the last several decades of Homewood Suites and Residence Inn by Marriott, and some of these long-term uh, corp, you know, hotels that cater to corporate clients. So you go in, you plug in Airbnb days, and then you get a long-term tenant, put them in there, and then go rinse and repeat. Now, the beautiful thing about this is you don't have to own apartments to do this. You can do this through an Airbnb arbitrage. And I promised at the beginning of the show, I'd show you how to do this without quitting your day job. What if you could go out and rent a house, rent a half of a duplex, rent an apartment, and you get permission to sublease. You explain the whole thing to the property manager. You explain you're going to have these high quality, wonderful tenants, you know, these engineers and, and uh, nurses and such that will stay there. And then you put it, on this type of program. So here's how the numbers could shake out. You could spend, say, $800 a month to rent the unit. You turn on the electricity, you get internet, you get cable TV, you get whatever other utilities are needed. And let's say you're spending $1,100 a month for that. Then you get your furnishings and you might rent those at first to uh, reduce your risk or you maybe can find some of these furnishings used uh, and uh, furnish your apartment for, let's say, three to $4,000. Um, then you turn around and market it on Airbnb. And the Airbnb experts I've talked to, I've talked to several, say you should be able to get two to three times what you spent in your base rent, okay? Now, with corporate tenants, you should be able to get a little less than that. But let's say you could go ahead and turn around and rent that for 2000 a month, okay? Obviously, in places in California and other cities that you could rent for much higher, some lower. But if you could get 2000 a month and spend only 1100 obviously, the cash flow on that is going to be something close to $900 a month. Now, could you do 10 or 12 of these? Let me tell you, the guy I met that I mentioned earlier, Martin, in flip-flops, Hawaiian short and shorts, and a beer in his hand at Dave Van Horn's conference in April, is doing about 20 of these, and he's traveling the world full-time. 
Now, he's done a really good job outsourcing. He's got assistants. He's got booking people. He's got like a marketing person. And he said he makes less than he could if he was doing himself. But he said he'd rather be in Costa Rica or Hawaii or wherever he is today. Wherever Martin is today, he's probably enjoying life more than most of us. So my point is this is something that can be outsourced. It can be something you can do while you're staying at your day job. And like I said, if you can do 20 of them like him, he might be making, you know, he's probably making fifteen or $20,000 a month. And he's doing it semi-passively. Now, you don't have to outsource everything to do several of these yourself. I think you could do it in your, uh, I don't want to say spare time, but I will say part time. And I think if you did set up your systems, you could even do it to a point where it's semi-passive income. Let me tell you about three other people who have done this. Martin did it. Al did it. And by the way, Al was the guy who founded this idea. Al's making about $7,100 a month, free and clear, every month. And what he's doing, by the way, is he's plowing that $7,000 a month back into renting more units, furnishing more units, and growing his portfolio. His goal is that when he gets to $10,000 a month and he can maintain that consistently, that he's going to quit his day job. So pretty cool. Another person who did this was a pastor in, I believe it was Tulsa or Oklahoma City, and they were tired of subjecting their kids to their pastor's income. And so they tried this. They actually got enrolled in Al's program. Al has a teaching program, uh, like I probably mentioned. And they enrolled in the program, and they got a client who led them somehow to a, um, a corporate tenant who turned out to be the minor league baseball team in their town. And again, I know it was at Oklahoma City or Tulsa. And they actually got a contract with them, and I don't know how much they're making, but they're renting to several of their uh, baseball players, and hopefully those are good tenants. I don't know. Uh, and then another person in Al's program, he lives way out in the sticks, and I'm not clear where he lived, but he thought he couldn't pull this off. He said, I, "Who's gonna? Who am I gonna rent to way out in the sticks?" So he he took the risk. He went ahead and rented one apartment. He put it on Airbnb. He bought a flower or fruit basket and he took it to the local airport because he heard this regional airport was training lots of pilots. And so he walked in, was ushered in to the, to the manager or the owner, whatever it was at the airport, met with them. The owner got in his car and followed him back to the unit, looked it over and he said, I'll sign a contract for this on the spot. Then he said something that shocked the guy. He said, can I get 60 more like this? This guy was in need of 60 long-term corporate housing <laughs> rentals. And so this guy had a whole new problem on his hands. And, uh, you know, tell me right now, who, give me a thumbs up if you wouldn't like to have that problem. Uh, I, I don't know what happened from there, but I know he had a huge, huge revenue increase. And I'm guessing that if he, felt comfortable with it, he's probably quit his day job by now. So this is the quick overview, and I hope it will give you some food for thought. I wrote an article that has a similar name to this show today. It's in Bigger Pockets: How to Make $10,000 a Month in Passive Income Without Quitting Your Day Job or something like that. So you can go look that up. If you have more questions, you can reach out to me through private message. If you want to know more about Al's program, um, I, Al, Al is not on here. I actually asked him just like an hour ago if he could jump on here and answer some questions, and he's not available. But um, if you have questions, we're going to go to those right now, and I will answer everyone I can. And then if you hang on in about 10 minutes, I'm going to tell you what my company's doing to implement the strategy and how we're making money in just the second week since we implemented this strategy. So, um, George, thanks. Wow, Richard Wallace says thumbs up. <laughs> the man Watson Limpervel says thumbs up. Thank you, yes, I agree. This is a great strategy. That guy definitely pulled it off. Uh, there's a Charleston Investor Association right now at Smoky Bones. Okay, thanks, Narx Narxis, Galaxy TV. Um, let's see. Kevin says, is there a turnkey for this system? 
um, for this type of investment. I'm not really sure if there would be. Um, there probably, uh, Al, Al's program is the closest thing I can think. Al, actually, his program, he actually has labels for your drawers, like the pull-out drawers, not your pants, come on, uh, in the kitchen and, you know, where you put your silverware and labels for, you know, how to tell people how to run, you know, set up their Wi-Fi and everything. He's got it all figured out. Uh, somebody said, hey, you might not be able to do this because your landlord might have a big issue with this. And yeah, I think that's absolutely true. There are some landlords that would not allow it. Now, I'm a landlord and we have 125 units in Lexington, Kentucky. And if you came to me with this proposal, I would give you a hug. So uh, if you're in Lexington and you want to do this in Lexington, you want to rent a unit from us and do this, you will have my blessing. So and again, like I told you, I'm going to tell you more about that in a few minutes. Okay, where do we find Al's program? Uh, Matt, reach out to me on private message. Scott says, how do you protect your risk? Is your risk basically the security deposit? Scott, I would try to get friendly with a landlord and see if you can get you know, a, a, a month to month lease. Uh, if they've got empty units, let's say it's 90% occupied, uh, they've got a bunch of empty units anyway. Why wouldn't they? I mean, and again, as a landlord, I would say I, I would allow you to do this at my place. So yeah, your risk is probably the security deposit and you're going to charge a security deposit to your tenant as well. And um, the risk, I think an additional risk would be if you can't rent it. Let's say you can't rent it on Airbnb or corporate housing. Now, you should be able to figure that out in advance by looking on Airbnb and looking around the area near your uh, units to see if there are Homewood Suites, if there are residents in by Marriott, if there are other uh, hotels. And by the way, I've heard, though I've never done it myself, that you can hang around the lobby of some of those hotels and you can even buy dinner, like you can buy beer and wine or dinner at some of those uh, long-term stay hotels and hang around and talk to people in the lobby there or talk to people in the dinner area and ask, you know, where, hey, where do you work? Oh, okay, how long you been staying here? Do you have a lot of other people from your company who are staying here? Follow the breadcrumbs. Follow the breadcrumbs and maybe you will be the guy uh, with the fruit or flower basket ending up at that HR department of that company the next week and seeing if you could become a provider for them. I mean, look, if they're paying, let's say $100, 150 a night for a hotel, you can certainly do better than that and make a significant profit doing this. So Susie says, I own a duplex, but my insurance company won't insure me if I have Airbnb. Wow. Susie, I would say, though I don't know what I don't know, I would get different, uh, look for a different insurance company because there are, um, I don't have it right in front of me, but there are massive number of people doing Airbnb right now in their homes and their apartments. Uh, check this out. Their, uh, Marriott has been around since the 1950s and they have 1.1 million rooms. Airbnb has been around, what, about a decade? And they have 1.5 million rooms. <laughs> so there's a lot of people doing this. Uh, a friend of mine right here in my town is making about $1,000 a month uh, on Airbnb. Um, how many countries is Marriott in? Marriott's in 101 countries. They've been around since, like I said, the 50s. Airbnb, in 10 years, they're already in 191 countries. So I got to believe that you can find an insurer to do that. Uh, I can't recommend one, but that's what uh, I would say that it's definitely doable. If anybody's insurance company on here, especially if you're on Facebook right now, uh, will allow this, I think you should, it'd be great if you can weigh in and tell Susie what to do or who to turn to. Okay, what do we got? Any other questions? This would be a great time to formulate a question before we're done here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what we're doing. So we have these 125 units in Lexington, Kentucky, and we decided to furnish two of those and give this a try. Now we bought the furnishings some time ago and we actually stored them because we got busy, but we just set them up two weeks ago today. Okay. We set up two units 
and we leased both of those for uh, almost double the normal rent within three days, okay? So by Friday, the first week we set these up, we had two units leased, and it was almost double the normal rent. Sure, we have to pay utilities, electricity, cable, internet, but who wouldn't want, I mean, think about this. Even if we broke even, we just rented two more units, which is almost 2% increase in occupancy immediately. Even if we were just renting them for a net break even to our normal approximately $800 a month, it would have been a good deal for us, but we're doing far better than that. Okay, so we're gonna set up some more units. And Nate, if you're listening, get those units set up. Come on. All right, uh, who else has questions? Richard Wallace says, how to start if your capital is low and you're just looking to get started and will reinstating my realtor license help with investing in real estate? Okay, Richard, um, I don't know about reinstating your real estate license. Um, that's something if you want to reach out to me on private message, I can try to take a stab at, but that, that's just kind of a hard question. If your capital's low, try to get a month to month lease. Try not to start till you have a corporate tenant. And by the way, there's lots of ways to get the corporate tenant. So don't start till you get the tenant and then quickly furnish it and, uh, get a nice deposit. Use the deposit to pay for the first few months rent and the deposit at the apartment and some of the furnishings. By the way, you can rent furnishings and I've heard the cost is between three and $600 per month. That's going to cut into your profit pretty severely if you do that for long. But if you want to minimize your risk, Richard, that is a possible way to do it. Okay. Logan says, who's liable for damage if something happens under a sublease like you've described? Well, I think that's something you're going to have to look at the individual lease uh, that you have with that apartment complex and uh, read it carefully because, again, if you're going to do this arbitrage opportunity, uh, you're going to want to make sure you've got that all figured out. I would say for sure you're going to want to get umbrella insurance, which costs maybe $200 a year, and then some kind of a general liability insurance uh, and tenant and renter's insurance, things like that, which is obviously very, very cheap. Um, bigger pockets. Okay, let's see. Lo um, let me see if there's any questions here. Okay, if you got a question on your on Bigger Pockets Live, pop it in. Um, Blapstar Jr. says, Where do you find a corporate tenant? Well, you can hang around hotel lobbies, like I said. Uh, you can go out to engineering firms uh, who bring in engineers, architects, people like that, surveyors uh, on short term assignments. You can, um, uh, Marissa, I'm answering that. Uh, you can um, also uh, put an ad on Craigslist. You can actually do a Google AdWords campaign. You can go into social media. There's actually websites for people who are looking for corporate housing. Uh, there's actually, if you're in a military town, there are, there's a website that provides uh, military housing. I don't know the name of it. Uh, there's a website and there are social media opportunities. So there are places to go like that. Now, Al, in his training program, covers so much more than I just covered. I just gave you what I remember. By the way, we bought Al's training program. I thought the price was ridiculously low, and uh, we are using it. We've got a guy, Nate, who I mentioned a while ago, who's actually going through this training program, and he's learning everything he needs to learn to do this in Lexington, Kentucky. So we're very happy with it, and that's why I wanted to tell you about it. Uh, Alexander says, can you share information about the class taken for this Airbnb arb uh, arbitrage? Yeah, um, just reach out to me on private message. I actually, you know, I, 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 I can get that to you. Like I said, I was hoping Al could be on here and uh, I can get that uh, back to you via private, via private message. Marissa says, there's a separate contract you should have the sub letter sign aside from the residential contract. Um, yes, if it's Airbnb, of course, that contract is built in. If you're doing a corporate lease, um, you can take a little risk and Google, you know, corporate, uh, long-term corporate lease and try to find one. 
You can find an attorney who has one. Did you guys know that if you join the Bigger Pockets, if you get a Bigger Pockets Pro membership, you can get access to all types of leases, contracts, etc. for all 50 states. Now, I don't think they'd have one that covers this exact situation, but maybe you can start there. Get a Bigger Pockets Pro membership. It was actually one of the best things I have ever done. And if that sounds like an advertisement, eh, it is. <laughs> I I'm so happy that I got a Bigger Pockets Pro membership. I've told people over and over, it's probably the single smartest thing I did in 24 years as an entrepreneur. Uh, Michael says, does Texas have a good real estate market? Michael, Houston is booming. It was just named the number one multifamily uh, market uh, in the country. Dallas is lagging because maybe it's a little overbuilt. By the way, if you are in Dallas or if you're in a place where you can find uh, a whole lot of Class A apartments that were just built and maybe they're overbuilt. Think about this. Get cozy with the owner of that Class A apartment. If they've got only 20 or 30 or 50 units leased out of hundreds, they know they're not going to have the rest of those leased for years, maybe two, three years to lease it up. Or even if it's one year, get a month-to-month -month lease from them and put your corporate tenants or Airbnb tenants there. Now, they're you're probably going to want to get a discount to do that because you're probably not going to want to pay the class AAA plus rate for leasing that. But hey, if I was the owner of one of those and I had an opportunity to lease at a discount just to fill two or three or four more units, especially if I was in a place that was maybe a little overbuilt, I would do it. So D. Brooks says, what about Madison, Alabama? I don't know. Um, look around and see if there's Homewood Suites and uh, you know Candlewood Suites and Residence Inn by Marriott, if those are there and if they look like they're semi-busy, you might have a good opportunity. Um, okay, Dave Iman says, do you have to be licensed for this to work? No, not at all. Um, I would think having a real estate license wouldn't help or hurt you at all, and that hopefully answers somebody else's question who asked that earlier. Um, Dave Iman also says, how about Philadelphia? Is that a good market? Yeah, I got to believe it is. Dave Van Horn's on here and Dave Van Horn loves Philadelphia. Dave, maybe you can tell us if it's a good market, but if there's a lot of Airbnb going on, if there's a lot of long-term, uh, hotels, I would say you've got a really good chance. Galaxy TV says, am I in Kentucky? Uh, no, we have apartments in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, but no, I am not in, I'm in Virginia, actually. Quan Brody says, how do you feel about the housing market in Charlotte? Charlotte's booming. It's one of my favorite markets. Now, it's rumored that maybe it's getting a little overbuilt, like Dallas is rumored to be overbuilt. I'm not trying to start any, you know, bad rumors here, but I've been hearing both because those are two of the markets I really love. Um, Raleigh, North Carolina, had been severely overbuilt, and it's not as much right now. So Raleigh might be growing faster than, um, than uh, Charlotte in percentage right now. By the way, if you can secure an apartment, if you're in the Northern Virginia area and you, like me, think that it's likely that Amazon is going to locate their new HQ2 in Northern Virginia, man, wouldn't it be amazing if you had an apartment tied up and you got it furnished and you were ready for the potential onslaught of people who are going to be descending on Northern Virginia or maybe Maryland or maybe DC or one of the other locations that's on that list. Some people think it's going to be Atlanta. Some people think other places. So uh, some Sam says, what about Indianapolis? Hey, I just spent three days in Indianapolis at a self storage seminar. It was awesome. And I think Indianapolis would be uh, a great place to do it. Galaxy TV says, I wonder what I can do in Kentucky. I'm planning to own properties in California and move over there. Uh, yeah, hard to say. I mean, like I said, we rented two out of two in Kentucky pretty quickly. But that doesn't mean it's a great market. It just means we had a, you know, at least we have two out of two uh, in Lexington. Um, Cheryl Davis. Hey, Cheryl from Lynchburg, Virginia. I know you. You're a real estate agent, aren't you? Hey, Cheryl. Uh, what about Milwaukee? Um, I would think it would be great. Isn't there some huge new company building and going to be adding like 
unbelievable number of jobs near Milwaukee. Uh, somebody can comment on that. I'm guessing Steven Summerfield knows that. Steven, if, if that's true, man, it seems like it'd be a great place to locate as they're bringing in construction crews and they're going to be spending uh, an enormous amount of time building these facilities. Randall says, how about Wichita, Kansas? I would think it would be good. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm in Orlando, Florida. How do you think this will work for tourists? Aaron says, um, yeah, I don't think it would be so great for tourists, but I think Airbnb in Orlando, when I was in Orlando recently, I exclusively used Airbnb every night. And so, yeah, I'm all for it. Um, Donald Appleberry says, I'm closing on a fourplex in California. Congratulations. Renting two, living in one, and Airbnb for the last one. Just another thought for anyone, especially in California, where it's hard to get started. Donald, great comment. I completely agree. My daughter's in Redding, California, studying at Bethel. Um, and um, I think it would be a great place to do it. I, I don't know the Bethel students want to pay top dollar like these corporations, but hey, it might be a thought if you're in Redding, California. Um, I don't know, like I said, I don't know that it, this works great for college students. Um, although I'm in Lynchburg, Virginia, and I do know that on the weekends during around the time of graduation or homecoming or parents visiting, the people doing Airbnb are crushing it. They're making like a thousand dollars a weekend to rent their house. So, and that's just in little Lynchburg, Virginia. So Marie says, hello from Whitten, Massachusetts. I wish I could do this now. Plan on doing more research. Okay, Marie, great. Well, reach out to me if I can help. Uh, check out the article that I wrote about 12 days ago on Bigger Pockets with a similar name to this webinar. And if you're watching a recording of this, I'm talking about uh, it was published in September 2018. And it talks about how to take, make $10,000 a month passively uh, without quitting your day job. And I admit, it's probably not going to be passive unless you set up some really good systems, unless you're like Martin drinking beer at 10 o'clock in the morning with all the other people doing your work. Now, who, who among you would like that opportunity? Give me a thumbs up. So um, uh, somebody says, how can I get more information if I'm watching you on YouTube? Uh, okay. So go to Bigger Pockets and private message me, or I, I mean, I guess I can give, um, I guess I can give out my email address. If you want to email me to find out information, I'm going to give you my email address in about 10 seconds. So get ready to write it down. Hey, Cheryl, you're confusing me with somebody else. I'm just getting started in real estate investing. Okay. Well, Cheryl, welcome to Bigger Pockets. And if you are getting started in real estate investing, you are at the right place. Bigger Pockets is the world's foremost forum for education, collaboration, and just all around great people, uh, over a million strong who are learning about real estate together, learning and growing through uh, thousands and thousands, thousands of uh, blog posts, uh, videos, uh, live episodes like this, uh, recorded video, and three podcasts. Bigger Pockets has the Bigger Pockets podcast. They have another podcast for personal finance and they're getting ready to launch a third. So get ready for that. Stay tuned. Okay. So if you want to email me to find out more, you can email me at paul at wellingscapital.com. That's P-A-U-L at W-E-L-L-I-N-G-S C-A-P-I-T-A-L. Paul at wellingscapital.com. I'm a little nervous right now because there are a lot of people on here and I'm afraid I'm going to get my email inbox blown up. So if you see my hesitation, that's it. Nick's one says, if you have your own apartment buildings, four units and under, could you do corporate Airbnb? Absolutely. Man, it'd be perfect. Uh, I think that'd be the perfect way to do it and do one at a time. Uh, Carlos says, what do you think of Miami? Um, I don't know. Uh, it seems like it would be great. Uh, Marie says, my day job's ending, going out of business. I'm sorry. I'd like to start this soon. I'm working on my real estate license now. Marie, you can actually do this before you get your real estate license. Let me tell you what a friend of mine did. Um, he just put an ad on Craigslist. He just said, corporate housing available, long-term, short or long-term corporate housing 
uh, includes all utilities, furnishings, et cetera, et cetera. And he got some beautiful photos um, of an example, and he's very clear, you know, an example of what your unit would look like. And he put it on Craigslist and he did not spend one penny to launch. Okay. So I didn't talk about that in my article and I didn't talk about much about that earlier, but I think you could do that and you could gauge the interest level right there. Now, don't get discouraged if it doesn't work on Craigslist because think about it. If I'm an HR department for the hospital, I'm probably not going to look on Craigslist for long-term corporate housing. But hey, give it a test. Maybe it'll work. Um, George Anderson, Texas, Houston. Okay, so if you would like to learn more, you can email me. You can private message me. And I'm going to answer a few more questions because we're 41 minutes into the hour. Christian Cruz says, if you were to rank the most important first steps that we should consider, what would they be? Also, if we truly want to make this passive, what professionals should we hire to help make this easy? Well, Christian, if I was going to do that, I would do it myself first and then figure out where what is killing your time the most and start hiring people to fix, to fill those gaps. Now, if you're doing Airbnb, one of the first people I'd hire would be a cleaning person. Maybe you can get somebody to clean a unit for, what would it be, $30, $40? And you can charge that back to the tenant on Airbnb. With corporate rentals, guess what? There's no fee to Airbnb and there's virtually no cleaning needed. You will need cleaning between the tenants, but would you need to clean them daily, weekly? No, I don't think so. You might want to provide a monthly cleaning as a service to your corporate tenant and even charge them for that. But uh, yeah, I think the first person I would get would be a cleaning person. Um, you might want to get you know, uh, an attorney or something to look over your contract. I wouldn't think you would need to do that. This is pretty widely used, uh, you know, this is a pretty widely used strategy. So, uh, hey, you know, I, I'm guessing Al's program has contracts available. And if Al was on here, I'd ask, but I don't, he is not on here. So um, somebody, at Lance asked, what's the biggest risk in a sublease? I really do believe the biggest risk is not leasing it out. In other words, having it vacant and having to pay the $800 a month or whatever. But hey, if you can't lease it for at least a break even to what you're spending on Airbnb, you're probably in the wrong market. And I would say um, that's another reason for getting a month to month lease. Again, my proposition is that if an apartment has empty units, they should be willing to consider cutting you a break and giving you a month to month lease. And you can tell them, look, if this works, I might rent five, six, seven units from you. And by the way, that's what we plan to do in Lexington. I hope we rent 20 units uh, under this strategy. But that's another story. Chicky, Derek, look for a partner to team up on a deal. Okay. Um, David Mormon says, who the heck is Al? Check out my article. Uh, Al is this brilliant guy. He calls himself a landlord scientist, I think. He's trying all these different experimental combinations to figure out, you know, how to use Airbnb, how to use long-term corporate uh, housing. Al has got this incredible program. Our company paid full price for it. And I don't mind saying that it is a great deal. I'll tell you, the price is around uh, $997 a month. Well, it's exactly that. And um, I will tell you, I assumed when I sat through his seminar at Dave Van Horn's event in Philadelphia that it would be perhaps $5,000 for this program. And I literally was shocked when I found out it was around 1000 Uh Chris Sweeney says, do you tell the apartment you plan on subleasing? Yeah. Yeah, you tell them the whole plan. And, and then they might get excited and want to do it themselves. Uh, so you might have to say, look, let me try this. And um, you might even, oh, her here's another idea. I didn't put this in the article. I forgot. Offer to split the profits with the apartment. Okay, so if the normal rent is $800 a month and you're proposing you can get $2,000 a month gross, say, look, I'll pay you $800 a month 
for the uh, lease. If you'll let me do a month to month lease, I will split the profits with you. I'll give you 20% of the profits or I'll give you an extra $100, $150, $200 a month to let me do a short term lease if this works. I think that would work. Not with everybody. Hey, maybe you go into your local RIA and find somebody who has single family homes and they can't rent them or they have, they've got a vacancy. Make a friendship with them, you know, buy them uh, punch and cookies or something. What's that mean? I have no idea. Michael says, I live in an apartment with a lease. What should I do? Um, well, I think, I think you could probably sublease. I mean, I think you could, if you want to sublease your apartment and move somewhere else, I assume that's what you mean. So just maybe clarify that question. Alan says, just confirming, but is Al on here? No, Al's not on here. Um, I'm using Al's program and I'm so excited about it. I wanted to share it on bigger pockets. Pedro says, only if they say no the first time. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, Curtis, Nix, uh, what else? What job should I get? Michael, um, I'm, I'm not sure uh, how to answer that, but I think that you know if you have a full-time job and you wanna do this in your spare time on evenings and weekends, this could work for you. Moses says, what do you believe is the best first purchase for a house? Well, if you could uh, figure out a way to get a duplex and, you know, house hack, which is widely discussed on bigger pockets, that would be a great way to go. And you could get an FHA loan, live in it for a year, and then rent both sides of the duplex out, move on to something else from what I've heard. Michael says, how do I sublease? Michael, you probably have to go to your landlord and ask them what you need to do to sublease. They may shut you down or they may love this idea. Show them the article that I wrote and uh, see if they, uh, if they like it. So uh, Logan Katie Brown says, you mentioned using the deposit to pay the first couple months rent. Are deposits supposed to be held in escrow or rental deposits a different beast or are there legal considerations? I misspoke. I misspoke there. Um, if you get a deposit that's going to be refundable, you should put that in a secured account. I was actually referring to getting the first month's lease paid in advance when they move in and using that to pay your rent, get your furniture, etc. So, um, yeah, if, if I mean, it's, it's all dependent on the lease you signed. You know, some people don't even charge deposits anymore. They charge an admin fee. You can do that. And then you can use the admin fee any way you want. That's what I should have said. Thank you, Logan, for correcting me. Mo Light says, will this video be available to watch later? Yes, it will. And Bigger Pockets can tell you where to find that. Do you use an addendum or a lease agreement? Rob says, um, I would use a, I mean, you're going to have to be, you're going to have to use the lease agreement that the landlord owner wants you to use. And then you can ask them if you can addend uh, or, you know, put an addendum or an amendment to that. Okay. George Klein says, my apologies if you've already discussed this. I saw this live stream and have arrived late. Did I understand you correctly? The Owl's program is nine ninety seven per month. Thanks for asking. No, it's 997 total for life. And that's why I thought it was kind of ridiculous. Um, I think he could be making more than that as much as he's helping people. I told a story earlier how one guy that took Al's program went in and got a, a contract with a minor league baseball team to house the, uh, the baseball players. I'm guessing there might want to be some security on that. Uh, another guy went to an airport and got a... Uh, an offer to provide 60 units furnished for the pilots who were coming in for training. And that's another guy who went through Al's program. But think about it. Even if you could do one unit, even if you could do your basement, I know a lady in Roanoke, Virginia, who I kid you not, her name's Elaine. She has a, um, she has a basement in her house that has a walkout basement, so it has a separate entrance. And it does not have a kitchen. She charges $1,200 a month to long-term corporate tenants, and she keeps it full. Now, remember, she's living in the house already. She's just leasing out her basement. 
They have a separate entrance. They come and go as they please. She gives them a parking spot in the driveway. No kitchen. I think they have a microwave and then a bathroom. <laughs> so, um, hey, think about that. That's another way to do arbitrage. You know, lease out your basement. That's a pretty widely known strategy. I don't think that's something new. Uh, people do that on Airbnb, but you can do it through long-term corporate tenants as well. Yes, George. So it's 997 total. Davey Mon says, what are your thoughts on using this strategy by renting property versus taking out a mortgage on a property? Um, where is the article you speak of? Dave, could you clarify your first question uh, on renting it versus taking a mortgage? I think you're asking, what if I own the property versus what if I rent it? And if that's what you're asking, I think both are valid, but let's face it. If you can test the market by renting it, and if you can furthermore rent it month to month, you're going to be way, way less risk. And think about it with a mortgage, you're kind of locked in. You are locked in for years to come. And if you decide you don't like this strategy or if it gets so popular that there's Airbnbs, you know, on every block in every town and now the prices are driven down or this strategy gets popular, you may not be happy to have that mortgage. I'm just saying. I like both, though. Uh, George Klein says the article is here. Hey, thank you. George just shared the article. And I'm going to see, although I don't think I can, I'm going to see if I can cut and paste that into YouTube and in Facebook. And here we go. Okay, so this is an article, and it would not let me work it into YouTube. I'm guessing Facebook's going to hit me the same way. So, sorry. Maybe bigger pockets can uh, post it. Oh, it worked. Okay. Facebook users, it worked. You can see the article there. YouTube users, it did not work. What do you think of house hacking, says Michael. I think it's great. Um, what's the best way to cook pasta al dente? Huh? Oh, I'm in the wrong chat. <laughs> okay. Uh, have you guys seen Lemony Snicket, by the way? Lemony Snicket is awesome. My family just spent, watched all 18 episodes. And uh, then the original one with Jim Carrey talks about pasta al dente. Why do I digress? I have no idea. Can you share on Facebook? Yeah, I got it. Okay. So Nottingham Event Production says, do you have your own YouTube channel? I don't, uh, but Bigger Pockets does. And I would... I uh, definitely recommend sticking with bigger pockets. Uh, Gamma Fighter, would it be legal to rent to my W-2 employer as a corporate tenant? Yeah, heck yeah. Why wouldn't it? I think it'd be amazing. Just tell your HR department that you're doing it. Uh, I think it'd be great. So Gamma Fighter, it sounds like you work for a company that has people who need this type of thing. So um, don't tell us where you are because somebody else might jump in on that action. It sounds like you've got a good opportunity there. Um, Nelson says, what do you think of the market in Orlando for rentals? I don't know enough about it. Uh, I'd like to say it, it's, it seems great. I used Airbnb there. And, uh, so, um, Shane says, how much leverage should you use and still feel safe when buying rentals? 50% of your money, 50% of banks or push it further than that. Well, in commercial real estate, we use something called the debt service coverage ratio or the debt coverage ratio. And you want to have your free cash flow be at least 30% uh, more than you need to pay your debt. So let's say your cash flow is, um, oh, I'm going to get in trouble using numbers. Let's say you can cash flow at $600 a month using the strategy before you pay your mortgage. Well, if your mortgage is, what did I say? $600 a month. So if your mortgage is $400 a month, then you have basically uh, the 400 times 1.5 is 600, okay? So you've got a 1.5 debt service coverage ratio, and banks usually say that that's safe. They would say that anything above about 1.3 would be safe. The larger the facility, the, the lower that can go. The smaller, the more niche, the more uh, in a corner of a small market, the more likely you should go with a safer, higher debt service coverage ratio. And if you want to learn more about that, you can search on Bigger Pockets for lots of information. 
Um, Christopher says, can you share your current results using this program? Yeah, Christopher, two weeks ago. So we bought the program back in April or May. <clears throat> we bought the furnishings in the summer, but then we kind of dilly-dallied around. And then in late September, two weeks ago, we set up two units and we rented both of them out immediately for almost exactly double the normal rent. Now that includes utilities, but that's a small percentage of the total, okay? So we were able to go two for two immediately when uh, we set this up. And I'm talking within two days, folks, we have these leased. Can you do that? I am not saying that you can do that. It might take two months, but that's the beauty of Airbnb. Plug in Airbnb while you're looking for the corporate tenant, and that is a safety net while you're looking for your corporate tenants. Folks, it is four minutes till the top of the hour, and I was supposed to be done by now, so I'm gonna answer one or two more questions. Rachel Bailey says, how can you find out what cities this will work in uh, or what cities have a need? Um, I think that you need to get Al's program, and I'm not just trying to sell it. I just don't have the answer. I would think in a, the sub-market, you'd wanna go near uh, some of these hotels you know, that have long-term, you know, Candlewood Suites, Residence Inn by Marriott, et cetera. That's what I would think. Nelson says, opinion on owning rentals under an LLC. Yes, I would. Is it okay to have possible uh, multiple mortgages, multiple properties uh, under an LLC? Yes, it is. It's okay. You should probably not have too many properties under any one LLC, and you should probably turn to an attorney for more information on this. Scott Smith is an asset protection attorney, and you can find him, uh, it's like Royal Scott Smith Legal Services, if you wanna ask for more questions on that. What social channels do you have? You can find out more about me, um, just really through my Bigger Pockets profile. Uh, thanks for asking, I'm with a company called Wellings Capital, as I said earlier, and uh, so you can find out more about us there. Michael says, what advice do I have for young people? I'm gonna give, I'm gonna close with this. Uh, a good friend of mine who has a very nice net worth, he has 320 employees uh, in a new company he just started uh, only three years ago. He's got a small jet, and I mentioned him earlier in the show. He told my assistant the other day, he said, I would trade my jet, my house, and my entire net worth at 56 years old if I could go back and take this one piece of advice and give it to myself when I'm 24 years old, which is the age of my assistant. Uh, I'm out of time, I can't give you that advice. So have fun everybody, I'm just kidding. So that one piece of advice would be decide one thing you wanna do and stick with it. Say no to 10,000 distractions, say no to 10 million shiny objects along the way, stick with that one thing. I wrote an article about Bill Gates in Bigger Pockets and I hammered this point and I said, look, he did one thing and he stuck with it. And there's Warren Buffett did the same thing. So many people who have failed are serial entrepreneurs and I felt like putting that on my business card at one point before I uh, realized it wasn't necessarily a badge of honor. My advice for young people and old people is the same. Stick with one thing, learn it inside out, do it well. If Warren Buffett has um, up to six hours a day to spend time reading, if Bill Gates reads a book a week, if um, uh, Mark Cuban spends up to three hours a day reading and staying focused, now he, he's done a lot of things, uh, you, can take, you can take that time, you can spend half an hour to an hour a day educating yourself through things like Bigger Pockets articles, Bigger Pockets podcasts, other podcasts, and you can learn to stay focused through every up and down market cycle, through every good and bad time. Stay focused, you'll win in the end. All right, thank you so much. It's been great being on here, and we'll see you here next time at Bigger Pockets Live. Have a great day, everybody.